Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see that, um, that, that people have turned out today. The weather's not great, I know. Um, I think it's important for us to keep awareness of Dr. Afia Siddiqui's story in the public eye if we can at all. Um, because for a long time she was one of the many disappeared people. People who had disappeared in the war on terror whose whereabouts were unexplained. I'm going back maybe five years now to when a number of NGOs began researching the disappeared people and found dozens of people whose whereabouts could not be accounted for. And she was one of them. And then we had that strange situation in the summer of 2008 when she apparently reappeared out of nowhere in Afghanistan, behaving strangely, and was arrested. And then apparently tried to shoot some US soldiers, but was shot herself, was then taken to New York, and was then put on trial, not on any of these allegations to do with terrorism, but on the basis of having shot and failed to hit the US soldiers. And then, and this seemed to be the, the most grisly part of the story, really, was that a judge in the United States courtroom believed that it was appropriate without, it seemed to me, any evidence of any crime having been demonstrated to sentence this woman to 86 years in prison. I still find the whole thing impossible to add up. There are so many holes in this story that, you know, we, we understand from stories that have emerged over the years that she disappeared for nearly five and a half years with two of her children, that they were held in secret detention, that if that, that was not run by the Americans, then it, was, then it involved the Pakistani government. This has been denied by those governments, even though there are so many compelling pieces of information to say that this was the case. And to have ended up with this story of and then an abduction and then a trial, and then this appalling 86-year sentence is, is extraordinary. Um, so, you know, I'm very glad that people are here. I wish there were more of us, because I think that this, this woman's story is, is one of the most extraordinary in the war on terror, and I mean extraordinary in a horrible sense. And I've always believed that hers is one of the darkest and murkiest stories in a narrative that involves a lot of extremely dark and murky stories. Um, I'm sure that some of the other speakers will have much more to say about Dr. Afia Siddiqui. And I don't mean to drift off topic, but um, if I could just before I go, I would mention that this week is also the 10th anniversary of the capture of a man that led to the start of the whole of the Bush administration's torture program. It's a Palestinian man known as Abu Zubaydah. And he was captured in a house raid in Faisalabad in Pakistan on the 28th of March, 2002. He was then taken to Thailand, where he was tortured in a secret prison that the CIA was operating there. When the Thai government got fed up of the US being there, he was moved to a facility that the United States had arranged to have opened in Poland. He was held there for a while. It was at that time that lawyers in the United States government came up with two memos, which will forever be known as the torture memos, because in that, a government lawyer close to Dick Cheney, the Vice President of the United States, tried to redefine torture and said that it could be used on Abu Zubaydah. He was then waterboarded. This is a form of torture that involves controlled drowning that the Spanish Inquisition used to call Tortura del Agua. He was waterboarded 83 times in the month of August 2002. He was moved from Poland to a secret prison that existed for six months within the prison at Guantanamo Bay, run by the CIA. He was then moved from there to a secret prison that was established in Lithuania, and he was eventually moved back to Guantanamo. But he, like, like the other victims of extraordinary rendition and torture and the secret prison network, he also remains somebody who has had no justice to this day, as do the many other high-value detainees who ended up in Guantanamo, and the many other high-value detainees whose whereabouts we don't even know. Some of them were returned to their home countries. Some of them, like the man known as Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, who was sent to Egypt when the Americans captured him, was tortured falsely confessed to links between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, which were then used to justify the invasion of Iraq in 2003. This man, al-Libi, was eventually flown back to Libya when Colonel Gaddafi was still in charge and mysteriously died, apparently by committing suicide in the Abu Salim prison in Tripoli in 2009. 
But there are people like Abu Zubaydah still in Guantanamo, suffering in their own way like Dr. Afia Siddiqui, who apparently went through a legal process, but one that I think we all know is something that is unfair when a woman is sent to prison for 86 years for nothing. Now Abu Zubaydah, having been subjected to the torture program, the guinea pig, if you like, of the, of the Bush administration's torture program, is a very ill man. His lawyers have said that he's had 300 seizures in Guantanamo between 2008 and 2011. And I'm sure that he's not the only one of prisoners who we hear very little about whose suffering is extraordinary, both mentally and physically, to this day. So I hope that we can keep all of these people in our minds, that we can campaign for the closure of Guantanamo, as well as pushing for justice for Dr. Afia Siddiqui. And those of us who are based here in Britain, and I'm presuming that most people here today are, can also help to try and achieve this through, uh, through signing a petition to the British government to try and secure the release of Shaka Armour. He's the last British resident held in the prison. And, uh, and we have a campaign going now to try and persuade 100,000 people in this country just to sign up to say to the government, we need this man released. So I hope that you will be able to keep him in your thoughts as well. Um, and thank you again for all coming today. Thank you.